Good afternoon, everyone. We have a couple of guests today. Um, run a show. Uh, our ambassador to the United Nations, Linda Thomas Greenfield, is here along with our special envoy for Sudan, Tom Periello. Ambassador Thomas Greenfield is going to kick it off with some open remarks. They'll take a few questions about the conflict in Sudan, uh, and then uh, I will return for the remainder of the briefing. So, Ambassador. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let me just start by welcoming Special Envoy Tom Periello back from Chad just uh, last week, but also welcome him back to the State Department. Uh, last week, Tom traveled to Adre refugee camp right along the border of Sudan. It's a trip that I know quite well. I was at that same refugee camp just a few months ago in September. I also visited the camp 20 years ago. Hundreds of thousands of Sudanese refugees had fled for, uh, for this camp in the months prior, 90% of them women and children. And among those refugees was a six-month-old baby, born only days before the fighting broke out in Sudan. When I saw her, she was suffering from acute malnutrition. So small, so fragile, I thought she was a newborn. There's so much about her story that I don't know how she arrived at the MSF hospital, whether she ever left the hospital. But I think about her today as the world nears a grim milestone, one year of horrific civil war in Sudan. How she was born as her country spiraled into conflict, how she was carried into Chad, her protectors walking miles and miles to reach a semblance of safety, how she spent those formative few months in a hospital too small and weak to even cry as doctors tried desperately to nurse her back to health, and how now she reaches her first birthday having only known violence, hunger, and displacement. April 11th should be a historic occasion as we mark the five-year anniversary of the revolution that toppled the Omar al-Bashir's regime, 30, his 30-year 30 reign. Five years ago, you could practically taste the spirit of freedom, peace, and democracy in the air as women and young people took to the streets demanding change. And yet, that baby I met in September is not growing up in a free, peaceful, democratic Sudan. Instead, she's one of millions whose lives have been upended and forever altered by this war. Today, nearly 25 million Sudanese people live in dire need of humanitarian assistance and protection. Three quarters of them face acute food insecurity. Nearly 8 million have had to flee their homes in what has become the world's largest internal displacement crisis. We've seen reports of gang rape, mass murder at the hands of the Rapid Support Forces militia, of girls sold into sexual slavery, boys been ma being made into child soldiers, of urban areas destroyed by area weapons and entire villages burned to the ground. And yet, as communities barrel toward famine, as cholera and measles spread, as violence continues to claim countless lives, the world has largely remained silent. And that must change, and it has to change now. The international community must give more, it must do more, and it has to care more. And let's start with the funding piece, because that's critical. To date, just 5%, 5% of the UN's humanitarian appeal for Sudan has been met. Already, the World Food Program has had to cut assistance to over 7 million people in Chad and South Sudan. And that includes 1.2 million refugees, like the ones I met in Adre, people who were already struggling to feed themselves and their families. This is a matter of life and death. Experts warn that the coming weeks and months, over 200,000 more children could die of starvation. The United States, for our part, plans on significantly increasing our funding in the days to come. More than just lacking aid, however, humanitarian workers have been systematically obstructed from delivering aid to those in need. From the beginning, brave people have been on the ground, often, often putting their lives at risk to save people in Sudan. But at every turn, combatants on both sides of the war have undermined their work. 
That includes the Sudanese Armed Forces, which has impeded the major humanitarian aid crossings from Chad into Darfur. <coughs> and that's where doing more comes in. Should the SAF not reverse course immediately, the Security Council must intervene to ensure life-saving aid is delivered and distributed, including, if necessary, through a cross-border mechanism. What's more, we must continue urging the warring parties to stop the fighting and get back to the negotiating table, as well as urge those outside supporters prolonging this conflict and enabling these atrocities to stop sending weapons to Sudan. Finally, I want to talk about the lack of care, the lack of attention the world has paid to Sudan. Just five years after a re revolution that offered a glimpse at a free, peaceful, democratic Sudan, people are losing hope. Aid workers have begun calling this conflict the forgotten war. Sudanese children are asking why the world has forgotten them. And let's be clear, I don't believe the dearth of attention is because people are ignorant or unfeeling. In fact, I believe it's the opposite. I believe it's because there are so many terrible crises, so much violence and pain, that people don't quite know which way to turn. And this is where I need the help of all of you, the members of the press who joined me in this briefing. As we mark one year of this conflict, please don't let it go uncovered. Don't let stories like the ones I heard in Chad go unheard. Don't let perpetrators of this horrific violence go unexposed from the generals who started the war to the backers who continue to fuel it. Don't let the feeling that we've forgotten Sudan become a reality because we need, we need to reignite that spirit of revolution, the hope and promise that characterized this day five years ago. I'm counting on you and the people of Sudan are counting on you as well. So thank you, and special envoy, uh, Periello and I will now take a few questions. Matt, do you want to give any? Oh, um, I don't really have any. Sean? Sure. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Ambassador, and special envoy. Uh, I could ask you uh, two things. Um, uh, Tom, you, you said before that you're hopeful with the end of Ramadan that the talks could resume. Uh, do you think that that's on the cards now? Do you see an interest, uh, a strategic decision by both sides to resume talks? And, and Ambassador, you mentioned a cross-border mechanism. I know you've spoken about that before. How close do you think we are to that becoming reality? Do you see that as realistically something that the Security Council, with the, the vetoes there, can, can push through? Come first. Um, we do sense a great deal of urgency to resume talks, and in fact, um, talks are already ongoing in the sense that we're negotiating every day and trying to align uh, key actors inside and outside with a plan that would end this war. Um, we appreciate that, that Saudi Arabia is committed to hosting a new round of talks and that those will be inclusive talks. Uh, we hope that that will be a date uh, that we can be able to announce soon um, and uh, build momentum coming out of the gatherings in Paris um, and start to have a sense of when that date will be. But in the meantime, uh, we are not waiting to continue to try to put pressure on the parties to come to the table. And we do think that there are some signs, while many, many signs point to the war getting even worse, uh, in some ways it's gotten so bad and it's starting to have such regional implications that it's also increased, I think, some of the diplomatic appetite to try to find an end to this war. And we're going to try to use uh, every lever we have um, to build that into enough political momentum and political will to end this war. Look, on the uh, uh, cross-border uh, concept, uh, we know that it is a concept that can work. It worked in Syria. Uh, we hope we don't have to go there. We hope we don't have to uh, push for a resolution uh, to go there. And for that reason, we're engaging uh, very actively with the SAF as well as the RSF as other parties on the ground to see how we uh, can work with all of them to facilitate getting needed humanitarian assistance into these areas uh, that is so desperately needed. Uh, but if we're not able to work with them, if we're not able to get their cooperation, then we have to find another way. We can't uh, sit back and not uh, look for other opportunities to uh, see, uh, uh, to, to get humanitarian assistance to people who, who are in desperate need. Michelle Kelman, back. Hi, thanks for taking my question. Um, 
You talked about other countries fueling the conflict. I wonder if you can name them. Um, what are you telling them? Because I think some of them are U.S. partners. Yeah, and what we, more can the U.S. do to put pressure on the, the political players in terms of sanctions? Uh, with all of the countries who uh, have uh, been identified, uh, as uh, possibly fueling uh, this conflict. We have had direct <coughs> conversations uh, with uh, every single one of them uh, to press them to uh, cease their support of, uh, and fueling of, uh, of, of this war. Uh, they've been named in the press. Uh, we, we've seen uh, the uh, Emiratis be named in the press. We've seen Egypt be uh, named in the press. There are others who have been identif identified in the press as, as well. And with all of them, we have constant engagements. And I know that uh, uh, Tom uh, has had those engagements as well. Thank you. Um, just to, uh, to elaborate a little bit more on that, um, to what extent is the UAE, can you talk about them helping the RSF and refusing to listen to US messages? to stop its weapons shipments. Can you speak about that at all? Yeah. <clears throat> I think we've uh, been making very clear to all partners across the region that escalating the war at this time is something that is going to not only have uh, increasing humanitarian costs, but actually risks destabilization of the entire region. Uh, we see a conflict that in some ways has been uh, between two sides that show signs of being increasingly factionalized in ways that brings in uh, some of the tribal militias that have stayed neutral. It affects uh, the ability of some of the neighboring countries uh, to, that have tried to stay, uh, be constructive and not get more involved uh, to get pulled in. And right now is a time that uh, every arm shipment, every bit fueling this uh, conflict uh, is something that pushes us closer to uh, not only famine, but to a failed state. And the flip side is, uh, this is a situation in which everyone in the region can benefit uh, from a peaceful and stable Sudan. The Sudanese people are extremely clear about what they want. They want to return to the constitutional transition uh, begun with great courage just a few years ago. Uh, they want to see a unified professional military uh, that is accountable to the people. They want to see uh, not a return of extremists uh, and, and former corrupt officials. Um, and they want that full humanitarian access. And I think they're going to be looking uh, across the region at who stood with the Sudanese people at this time uh, of great crisis and who was pouring fuel on the fire. And those consequences for those that are making the situation worse need to increase. And I think we are seeing, particularly around this anniversary uh, on the 15th, that, that finally some attention is being paid to this issue. And we need those actors to know that the world is watching. And we need that not to just be one day, uh, but that people continue to cover the sheer scale of this, uh, this tragedy, but also cover the inspiring stories. If you look at the emergency response rooms, you see young Sudanese who've created cash apps and local kitchens to completely disrupt the kind of barriers being set up uh, by the belligerent actors to get food into some of the hardest hit areas. Uh, these are stories of courage and of innovation uh, and ones that are literally a lifeline for many of the Sudanese left behind. We have time for one more, son. Um, <clears throat> Just to follow up on uh, this point about the direct conversations with countries fueling the conflict, uh, does that include Iran? And, you know, we've reported um, that Iranian-made uh, armed drones have, have had a big impact on the, the course of the war. Is, you know, so is that something that you're, you've communicated directly with Iran on? Are they included in those countries? And what would be the message? Uh, we, we've had uh, numerous discussions with uh, uh, countries in the region. And in those discussions with countries in the region, we've encouraged them to encourage other countries like Iran uh, not, to, uh, not to engage. I won't get into uh, what discussions we may or may not have, have had with, uh, with Iran, but in our discussions with other countries in the region, we've also asked for their assistance in pressing each other as well as others to uh, stop fueling this, uh, this war. And the one thing I would just add, sorry, add on that is, I think this speaks to the idea that for people in the region, um, there are many, many reasons to become pro-peace right now. 
the continuation of this conflict and the introduction of additional actors and additional negative elements only takes the situation into a more destabilizing direction in addition to the human costs of this. And we think it's very important for people to notice those trend lines and see that this is an opportunity and a moment to switch from uh, either not paying attention or playing a not constructive role to realizing we all benefit, everyone in the region will benefit from finding a path to peace. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So uh, before we get to questions, I have just a couple of opening comments uh, about the situation in the Middle East. We continue to be concerned about the risk of escalation in the Middle East, uh, something we have been working to mitigate and contain since the attacks of October 7th, uh, and specifically about the threats made in recent days by Iran against the state of Israel and the Israeli people. You saw the president make clear yesterday that we stand in strong support of Israel's security against these threats. Uh, Secretary Blinken has been engaged in diplomacy over the past 24 hours uh, through a series of calls to foreign counterparts, including Turkish Foreign Minister Hakan Fidan, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi, and Saudi Foreign Minister Faisal uh, bin Farhan to make clear that escalation is not in anyone's interest and that countries should urge Iran not to escalate. We have also engaged with European allies and partners over the past few days and urged them as well to send a clear message to Iran that escalation is not in Iran's interest, it's not in the region's interest, and it's not in the world's interest. Separately, the Secretary spoke yesterday to Israeli Defense Minister Yov Gallant to reiterate our strong support for Israel against these threats. Uh, on that call, the Secretary also emphasized the importance of Israel meeting the commitments that Prime Minister Netanyahu made to President Biden last week to improve the delivery of humanitarian assistance into Gaza and to put in place enhanced deconfliction and coordination measures. Our teams, including our special envoy for Middle East humanitarian issues, David Satterfield, have been meeting with Israeli, UN, and private relief organizations this week to push forward on all of those fronts. And while we have seen progress, it is critical that that initial progress be continue and that it be sustained. And that is the message we have been delivering consistently to the government of Israel. And with that, Matt. Right. Um, thanks. Matt. Um, just to uh, logistically, the, the calls that you just mentioned with the Turk, the Chinese, <coughs> and the Saudi foreign ministers were all today. He talked to um, the Turkish foreign minister last night. He talked to, to Wang Yi this morning and then early this morning and then talked to uh, the Saudi foreign minister later this morning. Okay. Uh, are there others planned? Well? Uh, I don't have any calls to announce, but we have been engaged in a series of, of contacts, not just to his level, but at other levels too, to talk to okay. foreign counterparts to send this very clear message to Iran that they should not escalate this conflict. All right. Um, I, I didn't want to raise this with the um, previous two speakers because I, obviously the Sudan situation is a situation on, in and of itself. Um, but so much of what they said very powerfully about the conflict in Sudan could also or does also apply to what's happening in Gaza. And when they say, when the ambassador and um, special envoy talk about how every arms shipment leads us closer to famine and a failed state. Do you not think that that same uh, logic applies uh, in Gaza? Uh, just because it's you who are supplying the weapons, as opposed to whoever it is, the Iranians, the Emiratis, the Egyptians, so, uh, you know, whoever it is that's supplying the weapons in, in, in Sudan, um, doesn't the same thing apply? I would say that we are incredibly concerned about the humanitarian situation in Gaza, and that's why you've seen the United States government working to get more humanitarian assistance in. It's why we've been pushing the Israeli government so hard to let more humanitarian assistance in and to improve their deconfliction and coordination measures so there isn't such a loss of political life. And then on the political front, it's why we have been pushing uh, with partners in the region to develop a plan for post-conflict governance in Gaza. So we don't see a failed state. So we don't see anarchy in Gaza. So we see a path forward for the Palestinian people's legitimate aspirations. That is very much um, uh, the policy that we are trying to pursue and that we have been engaged in, in, this, uh, in this administration from the president on down. But is, is it correct then, though, that the, the administration believes that every arms shipment to Sudan leads us closer to famine and a failed state? Uh, 
that that does not apply. You have a very different uh, in Gaza. You have a very. I, I, I you have that, a very. But, is, but, there, it is a very different situation uh, in Sudan, where you have a brutal civil war, um, uh, two warring parties trying to seize control of the government, and in Israel, where you have Israel responding to a terrorist attack against its people and um, uh, trying to achieve a legitimate counterterrorism and military purpose. That does not change at all the severity of the humanitarian situation, which is why we have been working so hard to improve that humanitarian situation for the so people So you in don't Gaza. think that every armed shipment to Israel leads, uh, leads us closer to Famine. We have continued to support Israel's right to. to have, I, 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 let me, let me say, it doesn't matter to me one way or the other. They are different say, conflicks, but, but the, I, I would say. I know they are, I would but say, I'm just I would asking say, you. They made the point and, in Sudan. And, I, and I'm answering. And I just want to know if you have. If you they feel the same way about They are now. very different conflicts, but the humanitarian situation in Gaza is dire. Uh, and that is why we are working so hard uh, from the president on down to get more humanitarian assistance in. And it's why we were working to improve deconfliction and coordination so we don't see um, uh, such a high number of civilian casualties that we, as we have seen uh, over the past six months. Thank you. Sean, go ahead. Just briefly on, uh, what, on the, the, the opening comments on, on calling uh, Wang Yi and others. Um, I realize you're probably not going to give a, a full rate on this, but, but how successful was that? I mean, do, do you think there's an interest from these other <clears throat> countries as well? to see Iran not as good? So I'm not going to speak for any of those other countries. I will let them, them speak for themselves. But the point that the Secretary has been making to each of these counterparts, foreign counterparts, both those in the region and foreign counterparts outside of the region, is that further escalation of this conflict um, doesn't just hurt Israel, doesn't just hurt Iran, doesn't just hurt the countries in the region but that it harms every country in the world. Every country in the world would be hurt by wider regional conflict. Every country in the world would be hurt by wider regional war, both economically, um, uh, diplomatically. And so the, the Secretary has been making clear to every country that has any semblance of a relationship with Iran that it is in their interest to use that relationship to send a message to Iran that they should not escalate this conflict. But I will let those countries speak for themselves about what action they may or may not take. And, and I have to ask, you know, this has been asked before, but uh, Iran, of course, argues that a diplomatic facility was, was, was struck in, in, uh, in Damascus. Uh, has there been an assessment at this point from the United States whether this was indeed a, a strike at a diplomatic facility? We do not have a, a final determination. It's something we're still assessing. Is it, do you think there will be an assessment at some point from the U.S.? On that? I, I do, but it's something we're continuing to work through. Matt, on, on this, yeah, uh, Michelle, go ahead. Uh, uh, reports say today that Iran delayed or changed the plans to attack Israel in, at the last moment due to U.S. warnings. Uh, can you confirm that? And do you still expect uh, an Iranian uh, uh, reaction to the attack uh, on Damascus? So I'm not going to speak to what Iran may or may not do or what our assessments are. You don't need an intelligence community assessment to, to see the threats that Iran has been making. They've been making those threats quite publicly and quite loudly over the, the past few days. So we will continue to send the message to them that it is not in their interest to escalate this conflict, and it's not in the region's broader interest, and we hope other partners will send that same message. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Nadia. Sure. Um, I wanted to ask this question, actually, to the ambassador, but the uh, Iranian mission at the UN said that basically if the U.S. or the Security Council rather condemned uh, the attack on the consulate in Damascus, this could have, uh, any uh, retaliation could have been avoided. So is this your understanding that actually you don't condemn it because you cannot verify whether it is a diplomatic mission or not? And also, do you think that Israel can go and attack any other diplomatic mission if this is proved to be actually a diplomatic mission and you don't expect them, any country to retaliate? So uh, Just to explain a, 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 few, a few things just in, in order. First of all, I think that's a pretty flimsy excuse from the Iranian government. If they don't want to widen this conflict and they don't want to attack Israel, they don't need permission from anyone else, either at the United Nations or they just have to make the decision not to do that. And that's the decision that they should make. Now, with respect to your second question, um, no, we do not want to see attacks on diplomatic facilities. Uh, we oppose dip attacks on diplomatic facilities. We continue to assess the uh, exact status of that facility in Damascus and don't have a final determination on that question. Okay. Okay. Saeed, go ahead. Yeah, yeah I, not, okay. not Iran, but you know, right. like Matt, I was struck with you know, with what the ambassador said, the similarity, you could change the word Sudan for, for the Palestinians or Gaza, and it'd be exactly the same, with one difference. I mean, you don't have any control over the conflict uh, in Sudan, 
but you certainly have. Sorry, the, 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 can let me I just, say, just finish this, my question? I have not asked fine, my question. Fair enough. Go ahead. So, my question to you is: Why has the United States not taken, uh, you know, it's the moral high ground and its ability and its leverage? to end this conflict as it can. We have seen this happen in the past. We've seen it happen in 1982. We've seen it happen with this administration in May in, uh, 2021. So my question to you, why has not this administration taken that step to end this conflict now? So first of all, Saeed, they are very different conflicts and very different situations, and that's incredibly important. The conflict in Sudan is two warring military factions um, uh, following a coup that overthrew through a democratic government who are fighting for control of, of Sudan. That is a different question than the conflict in Gaza that was started not by Israel, but by Hamas. Hamas launching a brutal terrorist attack that killed over 1,200 uh, Israelis and citizens of other foreign countries. And Israel has the right to hold Hamas accountable for those attacks, as the United States would, as other countries in the region would, as any country in the world, if it were the victim of such a brutal <laughs> terrorist attack. Right. That said, we are trying to bring a con this conflict to, to an end. You have seen us work to, um, uh, to try to achieve a ceasefire an immediate ceasefire of at least six weeks that would bring the hostages home and that we have said consistently we would like to see widen into a broader end of the conflict. You have seen us work on post-conflict governance to try to find a, a path forward for the Palestinian people's legitimate uh, uh, political aspirations. And you have seen us work to address the very, very severe needs of the Palestinian people in Gaza. So we are uh, working to try and do exactly that. Okay, let me just follow up. Let me just follow Please don't interrupt. Just yeah. let me go. I'll go through the questions yeah. and get to, get to who I, I get may, to. You know, I just want to follow up. I mean, you, you talked about Palestinian legitimate aspirations and so on. But insisting that this conflict began on October 7 does not recognize that, does it? Does it recognize that, this, that the Palestinians have legitimate aspirations that go back 75 years? not just to October 7th. So they do have legitimate uh, political aspirations that go uh, back decades. It has been the policy of the United States for decades to try to achieve uh, two states. But Said, I, I, I don't want to, uh, not only don't want to, I fundamentally degree or disagree that October 7th had anything to do with trying to answer the Palestinian people's legitimate political aspirations. Mm -hmm. It was a terrorist attack right. targeting civilians that killed civilians by a terrorist group that does not recognize the existence right. of the state of Israel. So uh, when you look at trying to achieve a peaceful resolution to the decades uh, of violence and the decades of political conflict between the Israelis and, and Palestinians, it is Hamas that has firmly rejected a political solution to that decades long dispute. Yeah, but do, do you acknowledge that uh, Gaza was under siege for basically 17 years? And uh, Sa you know, every other year there would be an attack and a war by Israel time after time after time, Sa killing hundreds there, and thousands there of There have been incidents going back in this dispute, in this conflict for decades. Nothing that happened <laughs> in on either side justifies the attacks of October 7th. I have a quick question on yeah, Iran. Yeah, go ahead. Um, just one, uh, there are reports of the Iranian foreign minister coming to New York City next week to visit the UN. Um, I'm wondering how uh, the U.S. assesses the likelihood of an Iranian attack happening during that period of time, if it would have any attack, any impact at all. I, I don't want to speak to a time frame. We're obviously very concerned about um, uh, the threat of an Iranian attack. We've made that clear from the president on down, but I, I, I don't want to put any kind of time frame on it. We were hoping, of course, to uh, avoid such an attack in the first place. Do you think it's moving in the direction of avoiding one? I, I don't want to give any type of assessment. As I said, it is not in Iran's interest. It's not in anyone's in the region. Any anyone in the region's interest interest for Iran to escalate this conflict, uh, and that's the message we're sending wait, to them. Wait, you were hoping to avoid an attack in the first place? Has one happened? An attack by Iran. Yeah, we're, we, no, one has not happened. We're, we are to avoid the Israelis attacking an Iranian. She, I, her question, her question was. I know, but, her, but, hold, you, but, but, but no, hold on, let me just answer the question. answer to her seemed to say, suggest my answer, that you thought the Iranians had already retaliated. No, my answer, well, that's not what I was suggesting. Right. My answer was in the context of the question she asked me, which was about an attack coming next week. Fair enough. So, uh, let's go, let me. It, on, say in, in, on that call, just the call yeah. to Turkish Foreign Minister, was it purely Iran call, or did they have a chance to discuss Ukraine, the Caucasus, President Erdogan's upcoming trip, and the, why Turkey? Do you guys believe that Turkey has enough leverage to move the needle? At Iran, they have Iran's ear. It, it, it's not just Turkey; it's a number of countries. It's other countries as well that have uh, relationships with Iran, uh, Saudi Arabia, China. 
uh, and we have made other <laughs> other um, had at, have had other diplomatic engagements with countries in Europe and other countries in the world because we want to send a very unified message. With respect to the call itself, the primary purpose of the call was to uh, discuss Iran's threats against Israel. There were uh, other issues discussed, but I don't want to get into those. Uh, any, any I was asking because we have a statement from Khamenei last night saying that any Islamic countries supporting Israel or not supporting their narratives, they engage in treason. Any that, countries that what? Any Islamic countries that do not, you know, fall in line with their narratives, they are engaged. They engage with treason. I was wondering how much this, this you know, uh, your calculation of calling Turkey in this case is far. Uh, so uh, it doesn't situation. have anything to do with with um, with those comments. Mm. Obviously, as comments are not are ones that wouldn't be just be rejected by the United States, but would be rejected by other countries in the region. I have different questions. Let me, let me stay Come in the region, you. and then we'll yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Um, on the hostage talks, um, can you give any update on whether there's been a response from Hamas, and also uh, is there a level of concern uh, in the U.S. government about the Israeli strike uh, that killed uh, Hamas leader Ishmael Haniyeh's family members? <coughs> um, how that might affect the talks? I I'm not going to give um, any update on the talk. Excuse me, the talks themselves, and that we continue to engage in them and try to pursue a successful resolution. With respect to those strikes, um, uh, I certainly hope that it will not. Um, uh, but I wouldn't want to make any kind of assessments. Stay. I would say in the in the region. Nadia, go ahead, and then we'll come back. Yeah. Um, there is a record number of land that's been confiscated in the West Bank um, that came out today. It's like between 2018 and uh, 2023 is 5,900 acres that have been confiscated. The administration has always talked about this two-state solution, and the major one of the major obstacles is settlements. So if this land has been taken, and there's not just a condemnation from the administration, but actually there is nothing practical that we see that will stop this land from being taken, that will undermine the president's vision. So what, or how can you go forward when actually there's no even base for to have a state in the future? So two things. First, uh, we have made consistently clear that we oppose further se settlement activity in the West Bank. We think they are a barrier to peace. We think they are inconsistent with international humanitarian law. And I will just say to put those actions in the larger context, um, there have been a number of things that the government of Israel has done over time that we have said are detrimental to Israel's long-term security. Obviously, settlements in the West Bank are, are one of them. There are other actions that it has taken in Gaza that we think are detrimental to Israel's long-term security. So what fundamentally it comes down to is we are working, as you know, with uh, partners in the region to develop a path forward for Israel and the Palestinian people that we would present to them that would provide for post-conflict governance in Gaza, that would uh, have a component to reconstruct Gaza, uh, that would provide further assurances for Israel's security by its partners in the region, and there are other countries ready to step up. And so I'm making, I'm making this a, a broader answer because all of this relates to that very question. It's not just about settlements. It's about what kind of future the Israeli people see for them in the region. And ultimately, and we're not there yet because we've not finished this plan, we've not presented it to the people of Israel and the goal, 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 government of Israel, but ultimately, this is a choice that Israel is going to have to make. Okay, just very quickly. The ambassador made a passionate appeal to us, the press corps, to cover Sudan, not to forget civilians, rightly so. But we haven't heard from any senior officials the same appeal about Palestinian civilians in Gaza. Number one, we have many journalists who have been killed, including our colleagues. We don't hear any, apart from condemnation, nothing's been done. Uh, to protect them. And second, why can the United States allow independent journalists to go to Gaza since you don't have anybody on the ground so they will have access and tell us what's happening there? So a, a few things. First of all, the reason you heard the ambassador make that appeal with respect to Sudan, and this is not for me to play um, uh, editor or uh, a segment producer, but is that we don't see as much coverage about atrocities in Sudan. We don't see as much coverage uh, about the plight of the Sudan, uh, Sudanese people. Um, we do see a lot of coverage of the uh, Palestinians in Gaza, appropriately so. But I think her point was that we would we would welcome seeing coverage of, of this very difficult conflict that we are trying to resolve uh, in Sudan. When it comes to um, uh, journalists in Gaza, we have made clear on a number of occasions that we want to see journalists protected. And the coordination and deconfliction measures that we have been pushing the government of Israel on so hard that the president pushed the government of Israel on in his call on Friday would ultimately help with journalism and, and make it safer for journalists to operate inside Gaza. And I will just just uh, make it very clear that we have we have pressed the government of Israel directly 
to allow journalists to go into Gaza. It's not something that we control. Um, but we have made clear that we all benefit from seeing what's happening on the ground, that we know what's happening there, not because we have U.S. Uh, officials there um, uh, and many other countries don't have officials there, but because of journalists who are putting their lives on the line to bring us those stories. And we've made clear to the government of Israel that we think they ought to let more journalists in. Uh, yeah, go ahead, and then I'll come to you, and then, then we'll start taking other ones. I'm going to come to you, Jamie, but I know I doubt it's an Israel question, so that's why I'm, I'm, I'm moving around the room, the room first. You may, you, may surprise, you may surprise me, so I'll yes, just uh, yes. uh, go ahead. Thank you, thank you Matt. Uh, America has a number of allies, but what message do they receive when America harangues one of its closest allies, Israel, and their democratically elected leader, Benjamin Netanyahu, in a follow-up? I think the message they should see is that we want Israel to live up to its values, that we want to see Israel live up to the same standards that we expect every country in the world, including ourselves, to live up to. Thank you. Benjamin Netanyahu is the longest serving prime minister in Israel's history. Clearly, the majority of Israelis agree with his policies since the majority of voters keep reelecting him. How does this mesh with what President Biden seems to be calling for? which is essentially a rejection of Israeli democracy. So it, first, I think that is a, a vast conflation of two very different things. So it is up to the Israeli people to choose their leaders. Um, uh, we strongly support their right to choose their leaders, as we do uh, for the people of every country in the world. But we are going to engage with the governments that they choose to um, talk with them about what we think are the policies that are in our interest, what are the policies that are in their interest. And you have heard the, the president himself spoke to this in the week right after uh, October 7th, when he made the point, these aren't the exact words, but it's the general gist that sometimes uh, in the aftermath of a horrific event, um, your vision can be clouded and you can make mistakes. And we're there to offer them our very best advice as a country that's made mistakes in the af aftermath of horrific events and to try to keep them from making some of those same mistakes. Well, it seems like there's an attempt to demonize the, the, the current Israeli government, uh, you know, their efforts to, uh, you know, so support the overthrow of the Israeli government with a lot of protests. So, so that is that is not and that is not what you've seen from this administration. We've traveled to, to Israel. Secretary's been there eight times, I believe, since October seventh, meeting with mm -hmm. with Prime Minister Netanyahu. The president has been there. He talks to Prime Minister Netanyahu all the time. The secretary just talked to the Defense Minister yesterday. We uh, we fully support the right of the Israeli people to decide who their leaders are. Thank you. Right. Thank you, Matt. The Secretary Blinken spoke with the regional leaders about sending a message to Iran. Were there any connections with the Iraqi leaders to send any message to Iran? I don't have any. I don't have any engagements to to read out today. Okay. And have you received any signals from the Iranian government that they taking these messages into their consideration? I'm just not going to speak for for the Iranian government at all. And um, in the past few times, the Iranian used it to use it to baseless decision to attack the Erbil and also Kusan region in a response to the threats from Israel. Is there something that you're concerned maybe Iran this time use the same justification and to attack the U.S. allies and U.S. friends in the region in the retaliation for that attack? So two things. We have made clear to them that they shouldn't escalate this conflict in any way with respect to Israel, with respect to, to uh, others in the region, with respect to U.S. forces. One of the first messages we sent to them when the Iranians were making these baseless claims that the U.S. was involved in the, the strike in Damascus is that that is not true. We weren't involved. We didn't know about it. And you should not use this as a pretext to strike U.S. forces in the region, including in Iraq, as we have seen their proxy groups uh, do over the past few months and the past few years. And last thing, have you granted visa for the Iranian foreign minister to attend the uh um, we never speak to, to visa records. They're confidential by law, and so I can't speak to, to visa records from here. But as law lo has long been the case, we take our, our obligations as the host of the United Nations very seriously. <laughs> so when he Jane. shows up in New York, you can just assume that that's confirmation that he got a visa. Well, you can't travel here without one. So I can't speak to it, but you, can, you can't travel here without one. But I would note that um, uh, Iranian foreign ministers have traveled to New York yep, uh, under administrations of both parties, including the last one. Yes. No, I'm so. not suggesting that there's anything inappropriate or untoward about it. It's just that, you know, I just, I mean, it's ridiculous. The guy shows up in New York, if he shows up in New York, it's pretty damn clear that he got a visa. I, I would welcome your advocacy to the United States Congress to change the law and allow me to speak more about any number of things from here, not just visa records. Janie, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, I, I didn't surprise you today, but uh, I had to ask. <laughs> yeah, I had to ask Ambassador Greenfield, and uh, I hope you can answer this. All right. I'll do my best. 
Okay, are you ready? Ambassador Greenfield will be visit South Korea this weekend. What agenda will she discuss with South Korea? Uh, also, she will visit to Panmunjom this time. So, um, I said I'd do my best. I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you. Um, I am not uh, in a position to, to preview her trips. She does have a press office uh, in New York, and I would urge you to, to send the inquiry. That's why you didn't give me any chance to ask her. She had a lim limited time. Sorry. Okay, I, would I would have loved her to stay longer. The more questions she takes, the fewer I have to. Right. Not that I don't enjoy our lengthy <laughs> engagements. All right. Second question, quick. Um, the United Nations Security Council's expert panel on sanctions against North Korea was dis disconnected with the U.S. summit report together with the other countries, and do you expect to discuss with South Korea or Japan about the continuation of this report? So, uh, as I've said in the past from this podium, uh, we are incredibly disappointed that Russia chose to block that uh, panel from going forward. And I don't have any specific actions to preview today, but we are engaged with our allies and partners uh, in other ways to continue to monitor uh, North Korea's nuclear uh, aspirations. Have you any discussion when the pres I mean, Prime Minister Kishida was here? Do you have uh, any chance to discuss? I, I would defer to the White House to speak to the, those engagements. Go ahead. Thank you. In that, if I can ask you about your new diversity and inclusion, yeah. Chief Zakia Carr Johnson, she's drawing new criticism for past comments. In a 2019 piece, she claimed America's organizations and institutions were, quote, riddled with racism, patriarchy, and exclusion, that they refused to reconcile with the colonizing past and called them a, quote, failed historic model. Uh, do you find those comments problematic? So I would say that, first of all, um, uh, our new Chief Diversity and Inclusion Officer, Zakia Carr Johnson, <laughs> uh, is one of the most qualified experts in this field. She has 20 years of experience uh, working to expand diversity, and it's something that we see as important here at the State Department that the, sta the Secretary has put a premium on because he believes that when our workforce looks like America and reflects the full diversity of America, our workforce is stronger and our ability to protect um, uh, America's national security is improved and enhanced. Um, and that's why he selected her to do this incredibly important job. Second of all, with respect to her quote, I have seen that uh, uh, people have used excerpts, um, uh, have not used the, the full context of it, but I would say um, a lot of this criticism seems to be from individuals. I saw former officials tweeting about this. Um, Secretary Pompeo uh, the hardest. Certain for, former officials who don't <laughs> seem, to, for whatever reason, to support our work to expand diversity inside the, the State Department. And that's just where we have an honest agreement, disagreement, where we think that's work that we ought to do, and we ought to hire experts who have experience in doing that, and that's what we're going to continue to do. And I think we're just going to have to disagree with some of those critics. Can I just lastly read you, Secretary Pompeo, obviously, worked here in the building, said, quote, the State Department should be staffed by individuals who love America and believe in our core principles, not ideologues who think that America represents a failed historic model. You want to um, respond, well, apparently he believes there are different ways to love America because one of the ways we believe you can best love America is to love its full diversity and build a workforce that reflects that full diversity. Thank you. Uh, come to you next. Alex, oh, sorry. Okay, thank you. Sorry. I should not mumble my... No, thank so much. Susan Ukraine, if I may, uh, going back to um, last night's uh, strikes, which uh, Ukraine believes that was designed to maximize attacks on uh, infrastructure, um, what's your reaction and what is your take of the state of play on the battlefield? And do you still believe that Ukraine doesn't have a right to retaliate? So we have seen Russia, unfortunately, um, continue to attack Ukraine's energy infrastructure. That's something they've done not just overnight, but over the past a uh, couple of years, um, and I would say it, it for us it comes back to the need for Congress to fully fund, fully pass the President's supplemental request, and it goes directly to this question you asked me about uh, the situation on the battlefield, where we have seen uh, Ukrainian armed forces having to ration uh, artillery shells, having to ration ammunition, and of course that has an ability, uh, an effect on their ability to fight the war and an effect on their ability to repel Russian troops, and it's why it is so urgent for Congress to act. But is there any uh, active restrictions on Ukraine imposed from the U.S., by the U.S., uh, to prevent them from so, violating 
you know, this obvious step to take it back to Russia. So right? two, th so two things. We have made clear that we do not encourage strikes outside of Ukraine. And we do not enable those strikes with U.S. provided weapons um, and that we don't want to see U.S. provided weapons used for strikes outside Ukraine. Ultimately, uh, when it comes to deciding how to prosecute that's, this war, those are Ukrainian decisions, but um, we do not encourage or enable such strikes. I have one more, if I may, uh, on uh, Georgia. So what is there anything you have learned during the past couple of days you know, since Georgia, Georgia government moved uh, move forward and submitted uh, the Russian law? I'm um, just curious, like, what do you, you, you made it clear that this is uh, taking Georgia away from European past. Do you uh, witness a democratic backsliding in Georgia? Is that your analysis? I don't want to make any broader assessment than, um, than uh, the assessment I made the other day that pertains to this specific law um, that we believe would harm civil society organizations working to improve the lives of Georgian citizens and would derail Georgia from its European path. It's still draft legislation, uh, and I'll leave it at that. Has, has, has anyone from this point I, I, let, let, me, let, me, let me move on just because we're running short of time. Michelle. Uh, do you have any comments on the release of more than uh, 1,500 uh, prisoners? We did see that step by the uh, government of Bahrain. We welcome very much the decision by the king to pardon over 1,500 uh, prisoners, along with the government's announcement April 9th that they will work to help the uh, recently released find employment. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, Sean, I'm sorry. I've, go ahead, and I'll okay. come back. This time I promise I'll come back. Okay. Um, in meeting alongside uh, President Biden uh, with President Xi, did the pending deal between U.S. Steel and Ipon Steel come up? Uh, I will let the White House speak to um, uh, those comments. In fact, I believe the President addressed them yesterday, or uh, speak to that question, I should say. And on Wednesday, uh, um, President Xi held a meeting with um, President Taiwan, Ma, who supports closer ties with China. Does the Department have any reaction to this meeting? Uh, no, I do not. Sure. Um, two things. One, going back to Ukraine, uh, the Swiss uh, have, have announced a conference on, uh, on Ukraine. This is uh, in, in light of Zelensky's visit in, in Davos and the, the peace formula he has. Uh, Russia has had some strong words about it, saying that it was part of, it's part of the Biden re-election campaign, I think, and uh, that the U.S. is behind it. Uh, does the U.S. have any comment on this, uh, on whether um, the U.S. will participate, whether it sees utility in the conference? So I don't speak to campaign right, matters, but that doesn't show a lot of uh, a lot of confidence in the Swiss government's ability to conduct their own uh, foreign policy matters. Um, I would say, uh, obviously, that is a, an absurd uh, allegation by the Russian government. I can't preview. I believe that conference is still several weeks away. I can't preview what the U.S. participation would be. But we have supported uh, Ukraine's diplomatic efforts. We have supported <laughs> Ukraine's peace formula. Uh, we have supported President Zelensky making his case to other countries in the world, um, and we will that will continue to be our policy. But we have seen consistently that Russia has not been in willing to engage in real diplomacy uh, about a path forward for Ukraine. Um, uh, Ukraine has made clear that at the right time they would welcome that, and they do, have not had a willing partner in Russia. And just briefly, I mean, do you generally speak, you think it's useful for the Swiss to, to hold this or support of, uh, regardless of the participation of? Look, I, uh, so uh, our policy on this uh, has always been nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. If this is a um, uh, a diplomatic meeting that the Ukrainian government supports and wants to engage in, we su certainly support their right right to do so. I don't have any further comment on the conference itself as it, or how it's going to shape up. Sure. Okay, just one uh, completely separate issue briefly. Uh, Mali, uh, I don't know if you've followed the latest developments there. Ban on activities of political parties and ban on media coverage of political yeah. parties. Um, anything to say about that? Uh, we are deeply concerned about the Malian transition government's decree suspending all political activities until further notice. Freedom of expression and freedom of association are critical to an open society. The transition government has already made a decision not to hold an election in February 2024 to return to a civilian-led democratic government, despite the commitment that it made publicly in 2022 to do so. We call on Mali's transition government to honor its commitments to its citizens and hold free and fair elections. In Mali and elsewhere, democracy ma remains the best foundation for stability and prosperity. Simon. Um, I want to ask about a, another conflict which is often getting forgotten, which is uh, in Myanmar, um, uh, Myanmar or, or Burma. The rebel uh, alliance of, of rebel forces have taken uh, um, one of the, well, the main border crossing with Thailand uh, recently. Um, the situation is very fluid in, the, in this conflict. Um, wondering, you know, this is right up against a, obviously a U.S. ally. Um, are you having any? Is there any diplomacy going on from the U.S. with with Thailand about, you know, how they should be dealing with this? You've got refugees coming across the border. 
uh, the junta forces reportedly trying to sort of use Thailand um, as a you know uh, taking flights into Thailand to to try to sort of push back the rebels in the, in this case. So um, wondering ever if, if you know the U.S. has any new sort of actions that you've been taking uh, as this has been developing. So we have been incredibly concerned about potential spillover this, of this conflict. It's something that we have been focused on with respect to any engagements with Thailand. Let me take that back and, and get you an answer. I don't have anything to read out. Go Thank ahead. you, sir. Uh, due to the situation in Gaza, uh, there is too much hate spreading all around the world, even here in U.S. as well. Is it a concern? It's absolutely a concern. You've heard the secretary speak to this on a number of occasions, including in Israel, when he said um, that we, the worst thing that can happen is people dehumanizing each other, and that once you see people on either side of this conflict dehumanizing each other, um, it gives license, uh, not legit actual license, but gives them, give, they give themselves license to do any sorts of things um, uh, that uh, we would oppose and they're not in anyone's interest. So it's absolutely one of our concerns. We have unfortunately sees, seen a rise in anti-Semitism. Uh, we have seen a rise in anti-Muslim uh, sentiment. And the president has spoken to this. It's something we've been incredibly concerned about both here at home and around the world. There are many religious scholars and others trying to portray this situation as a war between Muslims and Jews, uh, while many others believe it is just a territorial conflict. What is your position on this? And uh, what would you gonna say to those spreading hate in our communities? So I don't want to see. We would obviously, obviously, don't want to see anyone spreading uh, hate uh, in any form. And I would just say that we are trying to bring an end to this conflict as soon as possible um, and find a durable solution to this conflict because it is in the interests of Muslims and Jews and Christians, uh, Israelis. Uh, other countries in the region alike. It is in the interest of all parties to see this conflict end, and that's what we're trying to so One last question, if I may. Sir, you always talk about two-state solution, uh, but whatever is happening right now, it seems impossible. So is United States partners and mediators trying to explore other options to bring peace in that region? Uh, so I spoke to this a little bit uh, in response to an earlier question. We think ultimately that is the path forward. And I know it's incredibly difficult and it looks incredibly bleak, um, but it is our assessment that at the end of this conflict, it is going to end that um, if there is not a path forward, Israel is going to be um, back with the same security risks it has had um, since before October 7th. It is going to be uh, uh, in the same position with respect to a lack of relationships with all of its neighbors. And it is in is Israel's broader security interest to find a path forward for reconciliation with the Palestinian people, as difficult as that seems. And so that's why we're going to continue to pursue it. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, just three questions. Um, one is, uh, come on, it's my sixth briefing. Three questions is not go too bad. Just go ahead. So with regard to Iran, um, please correct me if I'm wrong that this administration has basically made Iran more stronger in these past few years till now this threat thing that has started. But can you confirm whether Pakistan and Iran, uh, you have information that Iran is supporting the ISIS in Pakistan right now, these recent terrorist activities. Do you have any information that it's the Iranian regime that is doing this or no? So I would obviously disagree with your characterization. I'm not going to get into a, a long rebuttal about something we've spoken to a number of times. But no, I do not have information to okay, suggest sir. that. Uh, my second question is about uh, uh, ex-Prime Minister of Pakistan, Shahid Khakan Abbasi, who, is, who was Prime Minister from this ruling party where Shabazz Sharif is Prime Minister. He said himself just last week that this current regime has stolen the mandate. Basically, Shahbaz Sharif should not be a president, uh, prime minister of Pakistan. Do you agree with him or that? Uh, no. Ultimately, as you've heard me say once or twice from this podium, uh, decisions about the Pakistani government are for the Pakistani people to make. Just last one. Um, uh, a few days ago, U.S. officials from Islamabad embassy went to meet this uh, gentleman named Zahir Jafar, who was convicted on a... Uh, murdering uh, his wife. He's a U.S. citizen. He's on a death row now. The U.S. official went to a Diala jail to meet him. Just a few blocks down, there was Imran Khan in jail as well. Thousands of American, uh, Pakistani Americans have asked to go and meet him as well. Why is the U.S. not going 
to meet the guy in jail. Uh, I would defer to the our embassy in Pakistan for answer that question. Go ahead, Shannon. I'll come to you next, Ryan. Thanks, Matt. Um, on the State Department's latest travel alert for uh, the U.S. embassy in Israel, it details how American personnel have now been limited from traveling within the country. Uh, it says it's been done out of a quote abundance of caution. Just wondering if you can say definitively whether this is linked to the threat to Iran. So obviously, there are, we have seen Iran making public threats uh, against Israel in the past few days. Um, Israel's in a very tough neighborhood, and we have been monitoring the security situation. You saw um, uh, us slightly adjust our travel warnings at the beginning of this conflict, and we conduct uh, ongoing assessments all the time about the situation on the ground. So I'm not going to speak to the, the specific assessments that led to us to um, restrict our families, uh, employees and family members' personal travel, uh, but clearly we are monitoring the threat environment uh, in the Middle East and specifically in Israel, and we, that's what uh, led us to make, give that warning to our employees and their family members and to make it public so all U.S. citizens who either live in Israel or are traveling there are aware of it. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. President Biden said this week that the U.S. is considering Australia's request that it drop its extradition attempt against Julian Assange and instead allow him to go back to Australia. Normally, when we ask about Assange, you say, refer you to the Department of Justice. But now that the president has said that there's a, there are diplomatic talks going on, that seems like it would be squarely in the State Department. So are, is the State Department involved in these conversations with Australia? What can you tell us about that is, these talks? That is a good way to try to get me to violate that rule about not commenting on ex extradition matters, uh, but I'm going to refrain from doing so. I don't have any comment. I would refer to the, the, the Justice Department for comment well, on this. Does it broadly raise concerns for you about free speech and, and free press issues? You often will see dictators say, why, why is the U.S. lecturing us about press freedoms when they're trying to extradite a foreign citizen to their own maximum security prison. So I will let the Justice Department largely speak to this issue. But as you've heard me say uh, here before, one of the crimes that Julian Assange is charged with is helping Chelsea Manning hack into government systems, not receiving classified information, but helping her actually break into government systems to retrieve classified information, um, which, as far as, I'm con as far as I'm aware, has never been considered a legitimate journalistic practice and is not the kind of practice that journalistic organizations typically engage in. Well, te technically, he offered to help her cloak her identity so that she wouldn't be discovered. Uh, we as journalists do that all the time I, I, with sources I, I, talking on so, Signal and uh, you know, other devices <laughs> to try to make sure that sources are protected. Is, is that considered helping? Uh, so I, I, I uh, am now a little bit, but probably further than I ought to go about facts that still are contained or alleged facts that are contained in a, in, in a pending indictment. Go ahead. Thank you so much. Two questions. So there will be a joint Pakistan in addressing Jammu and Kashmir dispute while uh, engaging with India through dialogue. Will the United States encourage uh, any mediation from Saudi Arabia between Pakistan and India? Uh, because uh, from very recent past, we say we observed that the United States encouraged all those engagements that goes according to the regional interest of U.S., including uh, the Houthis and Saudis talks. After October 7th, U.S. stressed Saudi Arabia to halt that talks. Before October 7th, U.S. was encouraging that. So, let me first, let me let me take you that that one back and get a complete and, answer. And number second, uh, 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 National Security Advisor had a uh, schedule visit to Saudi Arabia for talks on Israel normalization. Is it rescheduled or with the ongoing circumstances in the Middle East, uh, there is some policy change expected from the United States? So I will let the White House speak to the National Security Advisor's travel, but I did see him at the White House podium two days ago um, saying that he does intend to reschedule that trip. Go ahead, and then we'll go here and then wrap up for the Thank you. Uh, what is the State Department's position regarding Israel possibly conducting an offensive attack on Iran or Iranian interest, as Netanyahu today said, they're ready for a defensive or offensive attacks. Wouldn't an offensive uh, attack be part of that escalation that you say that we're trying to prevent? So I'm not going to speak to hypotheticals other than to say we don't want to see this conflict escalated uh, in any way. Go ahead. Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez said that he will recognize the state of Palestine before this summer and that he wants other co European countries to join him. Do you have any 
any comment on that? Every country has to make its own decision with respect to uh, when and where it recognizes uh, uh, entities in this regard. I will say on behalf of the United States, we have always believed, uh, we have always strongly supported the creation of an independent Palestinian state, but we believe that that's something that is best achieved through dialogue and negotiation between the two parties as well as other countries in the region, and that's something we're actively pursuing. Know that? I know. Do you have one more? Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Also, uh, Mexico asked today to suspend Ecuador's membership uh, of the United States after the raid on the Mexican embassy. Do you have any answer? Uh, I don't have anything other than uh, what we said previously, which is we have asked Ecuador to work with Mexico to find a resolution to this dispute. With that, wrap for today. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.